Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I won't waste any time with telling you who I am because it's not very important. Um, but I will start out by um, putting on the screen um, one of my favorite jokes um, because this is the way we always feel. <laughs> and if you, if you don't recognize that you are in this situation, it's because you haven't had an adequate map. Um, I'm supposed to talk to you today about resilience uh, in complex adaptive systems, which I've called operating at the edge of failure. I'm going to try and give you a sense of why it is that the systems that you operate always seem to be poised to fail, and sometimes do. I'm going to talk a little bit about why systems don't fail. Fundamental idea here is resilience, and we're going to tell you about the scientific basis of resilience. The key idea here, oh, sorry, not key idea. It's key idea, okay. Uh, the key idea, I'm from Sweden, uh, is that <laughs> we're talking about a law of systems development, which is every system always operates at its capacity. As soon as there's some improvement, some new technology, we stretch it. Larry Hirshhorn said this back in 97. If you want to see the, the, the quote in context, it's available on our website. I'll plug that later. Um, but the idea is a very important one, which is that the systems that we build are so expensive, so effortful, so important that we always seem to run at the edge of failure. And, and we are never free to allow our systems to perform extremely well. We always want them to perform uh, the next best thing, the next thing coming along. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is based upon systems research that we've done in a variety of different systems, including... Uh, surgical operating rooms, emergency rooms, intensive care units, commercial airline cockpits, military cockpits, semiconductor wafer fabs, a whole bunch of other areas. And I'm not going to talk about that research, but I'm going to tell you what the results of that are, because I would just cut to the chase, as my kids say. Let me start out by saying that the future of all your systems, although you do not realize it right now, is safety. You think of uh, your systems as those web app systems, um, which is my pejorative term for, for systems. Um, but there are also business critical systems. Uh, some of you are involved in those things, and there are also safety critical systems. And the key thing here is that these systems lines are merging. Your, your web app, those web app systems are becoming business critical systems. And indeed, business critical systems have a way of becoming safety critical systems. That is, the future of the systems that you are making today is to be involved intimately in some aspect of safety, whether it's dispatching fire trucks or uh, locating uh, uh, in critical uh, information on the web. All of this stuff is going to play out in a manner that has an impact on safety. All your, safety, your systems will become safety critical. If you do not have safety criticality in it now, you will have it in the future. What we observe when we study these things is that the systems we're working with are complicated, and more than that, they're complex. They have unexpected behaviors, they have unexpected responses to interventions, things don't work the way we expect them to when we push the buttons. We find new forms of failure, and they're constantly changing in both obvious and not so obvious ways. The other thing about these systems is that they're adaptive, and adaptive here does not mean just simply changing, but changing in a responsive way to the different kinds of pressures under which they're uh, operating. There's intentional and planned systems change and adaptation. There's unplanned and local responses. There's responsive and reactive kinds of things going on. Reactive is something you're probably very familiar with, but responsiveness is there too. There are structure and structural and functional adaptations that are taking place. And all of these things are happening on multiple time scales. The time scales for the adaptations can run from literally seconds all the way out to years or even decades. So we've got multiple adaptation cycles going on simultaneously across these large systems, which are very, very hard to characterize. I'm here to talk about web operations, and operations com communities are ones that I feel very comfortable in because that's what I do. I'm a kind of an operator. I'm an anesthesiologist. Um, and, and when we observe operators, we see that they are continuously monitoring some parts of the system, exploiting opportunities that present themselves, estimating the distance to failure, that is how far or how, uh, how close we are to the boundaries of failure, reacting to threats that are appearing along the way, anticipating future conditions that are going to arise sometime down the road, and 
um, learning these system features, learning constantly about how the system behaves and how it reacts. And by the way, I want to make a point here. These are not discrete activities. This business about monitoring, exploiting, estimating, reacting, anticipating, learning. These are not discrete. They're just words that we use to describe this complex activity that operators are involved in. If we want to be able to understand how to make our systems reliable, how to make them safe, we need to understand the dynamics of complex adaptive systems on short time scales, because safety often plays out here. So I'm going to give you a model now, a model of how systems work and why they're always on the hairy edge of failure. This model was originally developed by a guy named Rasmussen. He's a Dane. It uh, is fairly old. It starts in the late 1980s. But like everything that we now know about safety, it all, we owe it all to Three Mile Island. You have first this economic boundary, boundary of failure. If your system is running, if you are in business, if the lights are on, the doors are open, then you must be inside the economic boundary of failure. If you, if you go outside of that, you go out of business. And down below this, on the bottom side, you see an unacceptable sort of workload boundary. This is where people fall asleep. If you cross that boundary, you fall asleep. Okay? And, and that does happen. It happens mostly in battlefield situations, but you can work the crew to the point where they simply drop from exhaustion. So if you have a, an operating system, a functional system, it must be somewhere inside of those two boundaries. And then the last boundary of interest is this acceptable performance boundary. This is the boundary of what we are willing to call an acceptable performance. You can define that however you like. You can define it as mean time between failure. You can define it as no outages. You can define it as nobody dies. It, it's, it's your definition. But these boundaries enclose a space with an operating point in it. The, every moment your system is operating, it's at some place in this space bounded by these three boundaries. And the operating point is always going to be in motion. It must move. It moves in some ways in a kind of, you would say, almost a kind of Brownian way. It has to move. It's essential that it moves because, in fact, in order for it to be able to... to uh, uh, do anything, it's got to be adjusting to different situations. And what we mean by an accident, what we mean by a disaster, a failure of performance, is when that operating point goes outside of that system boundary. Okay? It's a very simple model. Three boundaries, an operating point. And now I'm going to add a couple of things. The first is pressure for economic efficiency. There is always a management pressure for economic efficiency to push the operating point of the system away from the economic failure boundary. If you talk to your accountants, they will tell you that the operating point is right up next to that failure boundary. They always believe that you're just about to go out of business. But you see that, that the closer you get to that, the higher the gradient is, the bigger the force will be to get that operating point away from there and to become more efficient in your operations. The same thing is true about this workload boundary. That is, the closer you are to the workload boundary, the more you will push the system away from that workload boundary and try and get it out towards uh, a space where there's less workload required. And as a consequence, you're going to have a period of time where the system is going to move in time, away from this sort of central point, these vectors add together, and gradually, the operating point will move towards the accident boundary. It will drift out in that way until it reaches out towards the accident boundary. And the way we keep from having accidents is we apply some counter gradient. We do something to push the operating point back. We recognize that we're near the accident level, and we push it back. And there are all sorts of counter gradients. You know some of them, like rules. You make some new rules, the operating point goes back a little bit, and then it drifts right out. Right? Make a new rule, it goes back. How about having, how about something like um, an accident? Accidents. Oh, accidents move the operating point a lot. You have a catastrophe, you have a disaster, your system goes down for a couple of days, you have healthcare.gov experiences. That creates an incredible force that moves the operating point way back. When you have a healthcare.gov experience, everybody says, I don't care what it costs, get it up. I don't care how many people you have to put there, get it up. So you push the operating point way up against the economic failure boundary because you don't care anymore. 
Your experience is really strong. You've got a real big problem. But you know what happens is that even accidents fail to have a permanent effect on that boundary. The economic pressure continues to push that all the time. So the accident gets older and older. It goes away a couple of weeks, a couple of months. You kind of forget about it. You remember that outage we had last year? Oh, yeah, that was last year. <laughs> and then there are a whole bunch of things like safety campaigns. That's where we, we get together and we talk about safety and how important system uptime is. Oh, this is really important. I really want you guys to be really working on that. I want, we're going to have a team meeting. We're going to talk about the importance of safety. These have almost no effect whatsoever on the operating point. And so, as you can see, there's not much value to them, but we like to do them because we don't know what else to do. And, and in fact, if you get people together for a meeting about how important some topic is, you know that you've failed. Any meeting... <laughs> It's true. I'm sorry. You can see that while I'm invited to speak, I'm seldom invited back. Look, <laughs> here's the problem. People who tell you to work harder have no idea what's going on, and they have no valuable solutions for you. So when you get those, those meetings where you put on the good, the good suit, and you go in and you get down on your knees and you, you know, beg and pray and stuff, it's over. Now, the interesting thing here is that although that happens, we don't have a lot of accidents. You would expect this drifting would happen all the time and we just run out into accidents. Why doesn't that happen? Well, the answer really is that we have this marginal boundary. We make a kind of imaginary line inside the accident boundary, which is our margin of safety. And we say, you shall not go beyond that point. We don't want you to go beyond this point. And we have rules and agreements. We're not going to do more than this. We're not going to change the system in this way. We're not going to allow these kinds of things. You can think about it as stuff like speed limits or rules of the road, a variety of things that contribute to this. And indeed, getting close to the margin, when that operating point gets close to the margin, that's a signal that the operating point needs attention, and you're supposed to do something about that. Okay, so why don't we have safe operations? Why do systems continue to fail? We've got the marginal thing, it's far away from the accident boundary, shouldn't that be enough? Why do we continue to have outages? And the answer to this is that you have to look very closely, and remember it's just like economics, everything happens on the margin, so you have to look very closely at that marginal boundary. I've just drawn the accident and marginal boundary, you understand that the, the economic failure and the workload boundaries are still in there. And, and we really know a lot about the, about the marginal boundary, but we actually know very little about where the accident boundary is because we don't have a lot of accidents. And the only information about accidents is the accident boundaries themselves. When we cross the accident boundary, we have an accident, we go, ah, that's where the accident boundary is. But the marginal boundary, the speed limit, the kind of idea about where we should operate, ah, that's what we really know about. We pay a lot of attention to that. And, and life ex our life experience will cause us to be in situations where the system will traverse out to beyond where the marginal boundary is. Ordinary operations will take you past the point where you are supposed to be. And you know that that's going to be the case, and as a consequence, whenever you get out there, you immediately come back. You go, oh, wow, this is we're way overextended. We've got too much to do here. We can't get in. We've we got to get back. And you move the operating point back. You push it back. Against the economic and workload boundaries, you push the operating point back. But you know, a long enough period of time of doing this and enough experience with this, and after a while, you say, what's the big deal? Why, why are we so concerned about this? We've been across the boundary a hundred times. What has happened? This is, any of you who have three-year-olds know this experience. If you're in the kitchen cooking and you're doing something hot on the stove and you go to the three-year-old and I say, I want you to stay outside the kitchen door, that line, I don't want you to cross that line. And the three-year-old will come up and put their feet right at the line, <laughs> right there. And they will look at you and you'll be doing something and they will go like this and like this. And the next time, they'll go like this, and they'll stay a little while. And then they'll go like this. And pretty soon, they're standing right next to you in the kitchen. <laughs> the same thing is true about the way we work our systems. 
Repeated experience with successful operations leads us to believe that the margin is too conservative, that we have space in there that we could use. Look, what is the problem? Why are you so concerned? We crossed the margin, nothing bad happened. Everything is fine. Why don't you just change the margin? Let's get a new margin. Look, we've been doing it this way for so long. Why don't we just operate this way? Let's, make, let's change the rules. And this is called the normalization of deviance. That was a term coined by Diane Vaughn. She was writing about the Challenger launch decision. Um, basically, the idea is that over time, we move the marginal boundary closer to the accident boundary. Note in this that the marginal boundary is shifting, but the accident boundary has stayed where it was. We haven't changed the technology of the system or the nature of the system. So the accident boundary is still there, and the marginal boundary is creeping out towards it. And now those Brownian motions that the point always has are, make it much easier to find a situation where you can create the accident. The result is that we have a slipping of the operating point always towards the accident boundary. We call this flirting with the margin. You know flirting, that's where I, I bat my eyes at you and you bat your eyes at me and we come a little closer together. That's flirting. <laughs> what is surprising in this world is not that there are so many accidents. It is that there are so few. You all know this to be true. The thing that amazes you is not that your system goes down sometimes. It's that it's up at all. Why is it up? Why does it stay up? You know how many holes and flaws and problems there are. How can it be staying up? And I would like to suggest to you that our models of safety, what we've been doing in the past 20 or 30 years, have shifted us from an idea about the 20th century ideas about reliability, stability, control, all those old ideas that were the origins of what we used to think of as software engineering, to a 21st century view, which is about resilience, dynamics, influences, about anticipating, adapting, learning, monitoring, about work analysis, all that sort of stuff. Our old system models were about why accidents happen. Our new system models are about why they don't. What we're interested in now is not why systems sometimes fail. What we're interested in is why systems work so well when we, all of our experience tells us that they shouldn't. We talk about this as safety one versus safety two. That's a way of putting it together. But the basic idea here, the critical idea is that the reason our systems are safe, the reason that we don't have the accidents is not because of new rules or, or the recent accidents we've had or safety campaigns or any of that stuff. It's because of resilience. And resilience is this monitoring, reacting, anticipating, learning kind of activity that in the short run is entirely concentrated in your operator communities. System safety is all about what can happen, what the operating, where the operating point actually is, where the accident boundary actually is, what we're going to do under pressure. And it's in particular about monitoring, reacting, and anticipating, and learning about how system, that system operating point moves. That is what we, in, is, we have this term resilience. And the scientific basis of resilience is the study of how that operating point moves and the relationship between the margin and the accidental boundary. Well, as my psychiatrist friends say, I see we're coming close to the end of our time together. <laughs> let, me, let me just say finally that I appreciate so much your letting me come and talk about something that's sort of wildly disconnected from software engineering, or if you think about it, at the very core of what it is that you do. And, and I, there are a bunch of papers out there on the website, www.ctlab.org. Everything we do is in PDF. It's out there. I say uh, to you in Swedish, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time.